I've previously mentioned the word sacrament. What is a sacrament, and why is it so important? A sacrament of the church is something that mediates God's grace in a very real and tangible way. Examples include baptism, chrismation, communion, confession, marriage, etc. In the Orthodox Church, sometimes these are numbered. One may often hear of seven sacraments, which mirrors what is taught in the Roman Catholic Church. However, in the early church, there was no set number of sacraments. Anything that was done in the church was considered sacramental in some way. So what's the big deal with sacraments, and why do they matter so much? I'll try to be brief, but it does involve some theological unpacking. In orthodoxy, we have an understanding of what is called the essence-energies distinction within the Godhead, as opposed to the divine simplicity model which was proposed by the Western Church. I'm not going to get into the weeds describing the differences between these two understandings here. Instead, I'm just going to attempt to describe the essence-energies distinction. God, in his divine essence, cannot be known at all by his creation. In this way, he is completely transcendent, mysterious, and invisible, so to speak. However, he can be known in his energies which emanate from him. Think of it like the sun. If one went into the sun, one would burn up. However, one can be warmed by the sun's rays. So it is with God. The sacraments of the church are a means by which God becomes imminent, and the energies of God are conferred to us by his grace. This is why sacraments matter. I mentioned earlier that God is mysterious. As is said in the prayer of St. John Chrysostom before receiving communion, I will not speak of thy mystery to thine enemies, neither will I give thee a kiss as to Judas, but like the thief will I confess thee. Remember me, O Lord, in thy kingdom. It is because of this that I cannot adequately explain what happens when I partake of the mysteries of the church. All I can say is that something happens in a very real sense, and I truly experience God in a tangible, mystical way. He transforms me through the sacraments of his church. Compare this to my former confession as a Baptist. Instead of sacraments, there were ordinances, and only two, baptism and communion. The difference between a sacrament and an ordinance is that a sacrament implies that something mystical is happening. An ordinance is merely a symbol. Christians perform sacraments because it is how God allows us to participate in his grace. By contrast, an ordinance is performed because God said to, as one Protestant pastor once told me. Baptists believe that nothing really is happening when one is baptized or partakes of communion. This is contrasted with historical teaching of the Orthodox Church, which is justified in the scriptures and was never really doubted until the Reformation. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 21 through 22, the apostle states, There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who had gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. I'll never forget when a Baptist pastor tried for 30 minutes to explain that baptism doesn't do anything when the scripture he just read literally said, baptism now saves. Also, when Nicodemus inquires Jesus about baptism in John chapter 3 verse 5, the Lord says, most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. With regard to communion or the Eucharist, Jesus explicitly states in John chapter 6, verses 53 through 58, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. And the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, he who eats of this bread will live forever. St. Paul warns in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 28-30, through 30, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 
For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Does it sound to you like the scriptures treat these things as mere symbols? St. Ignatius of Antioch even writes against those who doubt the true presence in the Eucharist, saying in his letter to the Sumerians, Beware of those who have false opinions and believe in unfamiliar doctrines about the grace of Jesus Christ. They are opposed to the mind of God. They abstain from the Eucharist in prayer, and they deny that the Eucharist is the very flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Those who speak against this good gift of God are dead in their descent. It would be better for them to have love so that they might also rise again. St. John Chrysostom says, The Eucharist is like a fire that inflames us, that, like lions breathing fire, we may retire from the altar, being made terrible to the devil. Many other church fathers say similar things. Suffice it to say that the Eucharist is not merely a symbol, and this is not a negotiable teaching. One obstacle to the more ancient Christian traditions for Protestants is the understanding of saints, and especially that of the Virgin Mary. While it is true that both the Roman Catholic Church and Eastern Orthodox hold Mary in high regard, we do not, however, believe the same things about her. I'll discuss the Roman Catholic view of Mary when we get to the broader discussion about Catholicism. If you would like to go deeper into this topic, I would refer you to my patron saint's work, The Orthodox Veneration of the Mother of God. For now, let's discuss the Orthodox view of things. Firstly, we Orthodox refer to her as the Theotokos. This is a Greek term which literally means God-bearer. It is a term of endearment and honor. It is also a theological proclamation. Nestorians, who were eventually anathematized at the Third Ecumenical Council held in Ephesus, believed that Jesus had distinct human and divine persons, and that there was not a union between the two. The reason this view is heretical is it separates Jesus' divinity from his humanity, and as St. Gregory the theologian said, that which is not assumed is not healed, meaning that if Jesus isn't fully God and fully man, then there is still a rift between creation and creator, thereby making salvation impossible. The heretic Nestorius himself called Mary Christokos, which means Christ-bearer, implying that she merely gave birth to Jesus' human person. In contrast, the Orthodox Church believes that Jesus is fully God, fully man, undivided, and of one essence. Therefore, we call Mary the Theotokos, God-bearer, or sometimes the Mother of God, to affirm this teaching that she gave birth to Jesus, who is both God and man. That theological digression aside, why do we revere her so much? I think it's important when discussing this topic to make the distinction between worship and veneration. Worship is what is due to God alone. Veneration is due to those who are venerable and honorable. Miriam Webster defines veneration as respect or awe inspired by the dignity, wisdom, dedication, or talent of a person. This honor is due to God's saints, and the Theotokos most of all, because without her we would not have Christ and we could not be saved. This is why she's often called the Tabernacle of Christ. Some think that by giving honor to the saints, that we are taking away from the honor that is due to God. This is simply not the case, as we are honoring God by confessing how he has honored and transformed his saints. We don't not honor God by honoring his saints. Quite the opposite. We honor God through honoring his saints. We have a rich tradition in the church surrounding Mary's life, most of which is documented in an ancient text called the Proto-Evangelion of James. According to this tradition, Mary was chosen from an early age by God to live in the temple, the Holy of Holies no less. When she hit puberty, she had to leave so as not to make the temple unclean by her blood. She was then betrothed to an older man named Joseph, who would eventually keep her and the Christ child safe after he is born. Betrothal didn't necessarily imply a sexual or marital relationship, and in St. Joseph's case, he was effectively Mary's guardian. We also believe Mary was ever virgin, meaning that she did not conceive other children after giving birth to Jesus. Therefore, Jesus' brothers were 
most likely stepbrothers, which Joseph had from a previous marriage. After Jesus' crucifixion, Jesus entrusts his mother into St. John's care because St. Joseph had presumably passed away. Also, according to Holy Tradition, it is attested that at the end of Mary's life, the apostles were all carried from various parts of the world to her deathbed. Jesus himself then appears to her and personally carries her soul into heaven. While we have relics of other ancient saints, such as St. John the Baptist, St. Martha, or St. Anna, the Theotokos mother, there are no relics of Mary's body, as we believe they were assumed into heaven when the Lord came to her. Her belt, however, we do have and is currently on Mount Athos in Greece. Many miracles are attested to the Holy Virgin in her lifetime, and many continue in the Orthodox Church to this day. Hence, this is why we venerate the Theotokos. That all being said, why do we ask for intercession, and for the intercession of saints more broadly? This understanding is simple. Just as one would ask for prayers from family or friends, so too we Orthodox ask the prayers of saints, who are also our friends. We believe the saints are not dead, but alive in Christ. We also believe, as did St. James when he wrote in his epistle in chapter 5, verse 16, the effective fervent prayers of a righteous man avails much. Being that the saints are alive in Christ and are participating intimately in his divine energies, they hear our prayers and can be quite effective as they are certainly righteous. Simply read the lives of our saints and one will understand why we believe them to be saints. I personally recommend the lives of St. Ignatius of Antioch, St. Mary of Egypt, my patron St. John the Wonder Worker, or even St. Nectarios the Wonder Worker, who has a film made about him called Man of God. I will personally attest to the intercession of one saint in my life, St. Xenia of Petersburg. For over a year and a half, I was seeking a new job. I had applied to nearly 350 jobs and was getting desperate. I began questioning if I was even meant to be in my career field, given all the various issues I had been experiencing. When I asked for St. Xenia's intercessions, she provided. I landed a new job, which answered all of my doubts in a way that could only be interpreted as divine providence. Through her, her intercessions, I was humbled. I was reminded that I can do nothing of my own accord and that I must put my full trust in God. Thank mm-hmm. you.